Así. Ok. Buenos días. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, welcome to all of you. Good morning. We are so happy to have this opportunity of joining a group of very uh, productive, interesting, and, and hardworking uh, activists that have been working in Cuba for many years in several areas of, of civil society. And the foundation wanted to bring this to the attention of the international audience and the Congress of the United States so that people could have a broader vision of what's going on in Cuba, which uh, it's sometimes is centered on one or another particular movement like Movimiento San Isidro that has become very visible or 27N that has become very visible. And not to forget that there are many other uh, areas and movements that have been working for a long time and that now are under special circumstances that Cuba is living at this very moment, uh, starting to give fruits, starting to, to have a result. I have the honor of being uh, the person that will be announcing also some of the senators and congressmen and women that are going to join us uh, in this session. And first of all, uh, as always, uh, in the front line of anything that has to do with Cuba is uh, Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman. Uh, Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schulz is a very good friend of Cuban democracy and she represents both Broward and Miami Dade counties. And as a senior member of the House of Appropriations Committee, she has been a strong advocate always of human rights in Cuba. So without any further delay, because I know she has a tight schedule, I would like to invite distinguished representative Wasserman Schultz to take the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Foundation for Human Rights in Cuba and uh, greetings from our nation's capital. It really is so incredibly important that we gather today to honor the brave individuals in Cuba who are fighting for their freedom. And today we celebrate the San Isidro movement. The United States has always stood for democracy and human rights. And our response to the Cuban regime who denies basic human rights for its citizens should set an example for the world. I wanna thank the Biden administration for the strong message they sent to the San Isidro movement before even taking office. Biden National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said, and I quote, we support the Cuban people in their struggle for liberty and echo calls for the Cuban government to release peaceful protesters. The Cuban people must be allowed to exercise the universal right to freedom of expression. My message to the administration is to continue pushing for the values every human being deserves. And as the representative for so many who have fled the Castro regime, I am here today to condemn the actions of the Cuban government and stand in solidarity with those who are peacefully demanding freedom of expression, the freedom to assemble, and the freedom to communicate through their art and music. That is why I plan to introduce a resolution expressing Congress's solidarity with the San Isidro movement. It will be a companion measure to the Senate resolution introduced by Senators Menendez and Rubio. The people of Cuba and the San Isidro movement have shown incredible tenacity in the face of adversity. They must know, as must the whole world, that the United States Congress stands united behind their demands for freedom and democracy. The arbitrary arrests, censorship, and harassment must come to an end. We demand nothing less than the full restoration of freedom of expression and democracy for the Cuban people. Through this resolution, we stand in solidarity with the San Isidro movement and their dreams of freedom, and we condemn the growing attacks by the intolerant Castro regime. This resolution demands the repeal of the laws that gave the government the power to silence these artists in the first place. It is my sincerest hope that governments and legislatures across the world join us in supporting these, these democratic activists in Cuba as they struggle for the liberty that we are so privileged to have here in the United States. We must use our position of leadership in the international community to work with our allies to pressure the Cuban government. We cannot retreat into the isolationism of years past and cozy up to dictators, which only erodes our leadership and moral authority. And we must address every facet of the ongoing human rights abuses in Cuba. This is why I support my friend Congressman Albio Siri's resolution condemning the Cuban government's role illegally trafficking Cuban doctors. The government's so-called medical missions abroad 
include forcing doctors to participate against their will, garnishing them as much as 75% of their wages, threatening their families, surveilling them, and restricting their movement. Americans everywhere have a responsibility to stand in solidarity with those demanding justice in Cuba. I will be working closely with National Security Advisor Sullivan, Secretary Blinken, and President Biden to continue pressuring the Cuban government, supporting the San Isidro movement, and helping the Cuban people achieve real change. While they continue to be targeted in Cuba, the members of the San Isidro movement are heard loud and clear around the world, and they will not be silenced. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Representative. We are very pleased to have you with us. We know the sacrifices that you made for your schedule to join us at this moment. So we're pleased that we were able to finally have you with us. It's an honor. Thank I you. I would so like much. now to thank you. I would like to hear a brief message by Senator Bob Menendez, who has also been a tireless supporter of the Cuban cause since he first came to Congress in 1992. And we are so proud that he's also one of our own Cuban Americans, who's now the chairman of the powerful Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Is the, uh, okay. Muy buenos dias. I want to thank the Foundation for Human Rights in Cuba, its president, Tony Costa, and its director, Juan Antonio Blanco, for inviting me to today's event. Y con mucho gusto quiero agradecer a los miembros del Movimiento San Isidro que nos acompañan en este diálogo tan importante. Es un orgullo estar aquí con ustedes. In recent months, the world has witnessed the renewed courage of the Cuban people in the face of relentless repression. We have seen brave artists speak out against the Cuban regime's arbitrary arrest of their friend and colleague, Denis Solis. We have seen activists stand strong against the regime's efforts to discredit their movement. Y en las manifestaciones pacíficas de esos valientes artistas y activistas del movimiento San Isidro, el mundo ha visto lo que todos en este evento ya sabemos, que el pueblo cubano quiere que se escuche su voz, que exige respeto por sus derechos más fundamentales, que quiere una sociedad basada en los principios de tolerancia, libre expresión y democracia. As we all know, activism in Cuba comes with a cost and we cannot take the San Isidro movement for granted. That's why earlier this month, as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I authored a bipartisan resolution in the United States Senate expressing our solidarity, calling for the release of Denis Solis and all of the artists unjustly detained, and calling on the Cuban regime to engage in meaningful dialogue with members of the San Isidro movement and the activists seeking to advance freedom of expression. Pero, en vez de escuchar las demandas del pueblo cubano, el régimen ha reaccionado con miedo. El temor le obligó al régimen a cortar el internet en la isla en el mes de noviembre para frenar las noticias de la protesta del Movimiento San Isidro. Fue un acto de miedo cuando el Ministerio de Cultura atacó físicamente a un grupo de artistas y activistas frente al Ministerio el 27 de enero. I'm outraged as I am by this new wave of repression. I am also cautiously optimistic. My friends, the Cuban regime is behaving how all authoritarian governments behave when they realize that they have no other option but to change. After six decades, Cuba's citizens are emboldened like never before. The regime doesn't want the world to see these protests because they represent an existential threat to their power. Now, the regime's efforts to stifle the media, artists, and ordinary citizens are backfiring. The Cuban people have allies in the outside world, and we, the American people, are watching. Here in the United States, we will never shy away from using our voices to support democracy 
and fundamental freedoms in Cuba. We will never hesitate to call on Cuba's authoritarian regime to take steps to restore and respect the rights of its own citizens. We will always insist on meaningful change, and that starts with the regime listening to independent civil society, including the dialogue initiated by the San Isidro movement. Por eso, a nuestros amigos del movimiento San Isidro, les digo que el mundo está mirando y respaldamos sus esfuerzos. Y a todos los cubanos que sueñan con un futuro de patria y vida, me mantengo en solidaridad absoluta con ustedes. Muchísimas gracias. We thank the distinguished Senator Menendez for his kind words and his interest in addressing this meeting and his initiatives in support of civil society in Cuba. And now I would like to take uh, the next speaker, which uh, I would invite Kisi Macias uh, to take the floor. Let me introduce her briefly. Kisi Macias have dedicated most of her life uh, to working with different causes in Cuba. She's an artist, uh, a very good artist, by the way. She has, she's also considered a miracle maker because she's the only one that I know at least that was able to produce a sort of Woodstock in Cuba under the repression of the Cuban government for several days that was, was named the Festival Rotilla. And she also produced a number of concerts in the, in the outskirts of Havana with rap and urban music, uh, which was also repressed. And now we're seeing the fruits of, of all the work that she started in Cuba uh, with this song that has shaken the Cuban government with Patria y Vida. So I think, Kisi, that you have a lot to teach us and a lot to, uh, you know, information to pass us uh, on how this movement uh, is, goes beyond uh, Movimiento San Isidro. How you were very much connected to the birth of Movimiento San Isidro at the very beginning, but, uh, and you're still at this moment, but we would like to know also, what is your opinion on the kind of crisis that the Cuban government is going through? Because many people talk about the economic crisis, but many of us also see that there is a legitimacy crisis, that they have lost not only financial capital, but what political scientists call symbolic capital. They have presented themselves for a long time as the representatives of progresses, progressivism, uh, the struggle against racism and so on. Uh, and, and people don't see them, people in Cuba don't see them as, as such anymore. People see them as a group of racist, you know, egotistical people that are concentrating power in a very few number of persons and are keep turning their backs to the misery that the, the Cuban people is going through at this point. So I am not going to replace your wisdom. You are the best one to give us, you know, an opinion on what is really going on. Why do you think that this crisis is worse uh, to the economic crisis that Cuba went through in the 90s? If you think that this crisis is, is more broad, more comprehensive, more systemic. You have the floor. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you, Juan Antonio, for inviting me to this panel. I'm very honored to have a presence and a voice here. Um, I would like to introduce myself as a person that through art specifically is is fighting and giving a um, struggle for freedom of expression in Cuba. Um, I think art is an essential uh, tool for social and personal transformation in oppressive circumstances. Um, <clears throat> as you said before, I've been participating in several movements uh, that to ours trying to raise the voice of people in Cuba that have no rights, uh, basically. These people is most of them from neglected communities in all over the country. 
um, people that has no access to any kind of possibilities because the government in Cuba has denied them and has like forgot them in a, in a sense of say that no. Um, I first started by teaching um, art workshops in neglected communities that have no access to cultural um, uh, <clears throat> and recognize collective possibilities. Uh, as part of that, I founded the group Onisona Franca, that was um, a collective that makes all kinds of art and offer them to the <clears throat> communities in Havana. But they were very critical with the government positions because as they were based in the community's activities, they, they denounce the um, political system in Cuba and how they misrepresent most of the people. We did a poetry festival that group of artists from all over the country, and um, not just alternative artists, but the uh, um, <clears throat> legally recognized by the government artists. And in this space, we propose the dialogue between all Cuban society actors as a way to create a new space, a new voice for the people. And as it was a space of freedom, we suffered the prosecution and repression from the government because the, they deny any possibility to Cubans to express their needs and their curiosity and of most important they try to stop Cubans to make a, like a union because as we know, Cuban government always try to divide people in Cuba as a strategy to silence the voices of the Cuban repressed and <clears throat> independent artists and uh, independent art, artists and actors of the civil society. That's what happened with the Rutilla Festival that gathered more than 20,000 young people in a beach near the capital um, where there was no political presence at that time. Um, artists like Aldiano, Cibito El Libre and Escuadron Patriota could offer a co concert to thousands of young people that were, that filled the, power of their denouncements. Of course, this festival was also uh, suffered from the censorship of the government and the, it was canceled by the government on 2011 because they cannot allow to young Cubans to express themselves, to express their claims to um, <clears throat> to create a conscious, a civic conscious between the young people in Cuba. Uh, after that, I also participated on the project Estado de Sats, who at some point 
could gather together most of the opposition initiatives that we had in Cuba at that time. Um, we tried to spread the war or and the work of those uh, opposition initiatives by documenting and um, distributing information about the repression of the system and also about the in, uh, projects they have uh, for a new Cuba. It was about thinking a new country where we all have the same rights, um, where we all have the possibility or an opportunity to generate a change between the island, inside the island, sorry. As part of SAS, um, uh, we created um, a documentary called Gusano, where we could um, document the fully organization and, and the fully organization of a reputation art against the um, civic actors and civic so activists of the society in Cuba. This documentary is international known because it recounts the history of the repudiation acts in Cuba where people was, was and still is being uh, <clears throat> Uh, beaten and, and sorry because my English is not that good, <laughs> but is uh, a reputation act is uh, when people from government try to beat and repress people that is trying to express themselves with liberty. After that, um, I came to United States, but I keep raising my voice for Cuban uh, rights and uh, our struggles for freedom. As, as part of that activate, activist, I joined the Movimiento San Isidro in Cuba that was created back in 2018. I think um, we all know that <clears throat> after uh, the um, after the Diaz Canel took the his inauguration day, he signed uh, decree three four nine that basically sharpens sharpens the censorship for independent art in Cuba. This decree uh, makes like um, legal the confiscate or fines or sanctions for artists that have no formal links with the government institutions as a protest against this unilateral decision of the government to introduce the decree 349, a group of artists and activists gather around Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara to protest against this uh, 349 decree. Um, Casey, I'm out uh, oh, no. Sorry. Well, I'm going to stop you now because we want to go back to that story later with the others and we still need to, to go around. But you have given us a, a big chunk of information uh, on yourself, on your background, on, the, on your experience, and on the experience of the movement as such. We go back to you again in the next round of, of questions. I should inform everybody that Alfredo Martinez, the independent journalist and member of the 27N movement has been disconnected in Cuba. But I have a video that he advanced to us just in case that this may happen. Uh, before doing that, I am going to give the floor to uh, Dennis, 
because after all, I mean, we have in video, we have Alfredo and I don't want you to be disconnected before you have an opportunity of speaking live to us. Uh, yeah. Please try to, to hold your, uh, we, we have so many messages and so on that we have to make the best use of our time. So please try to use five minutes. Yeah, means. Uh, thank you, thank you for everyone. Uh, I would like to talk about the, uh, the animalistic activists in my country. It's a very complicated situation right now. And the, it's not a secret for anyone that the government see us as a threat. It's, uh, it's also happening in, with another independent social movement in the country. Harassment, um, the, persecution, the, the persecution and the harassment by the government is doing because we are creating space for people uh, I mean, we create a space when, uh, where people can think and speak freely. Also, because the independent social uh, movement have been an example, a beautiful example, um, and I have been helping and um, have helped in the creation of another other movement in the country. Um, in my experience, in my experience, like an animal, uh, animalistic activities uh, I mean, is has been sometimes complicated because uh, the situation with animals inside of the country. Um, um, two days ago, two days ago in the morning, uh, twenty-two people were in the Ministry of Agriculture in Havana. A uh, Pacific protested. A Pacific manifestation, because we we asking we ask the government for an animal protection law. We need an animal protection law in the country. Many countries in Latin America, North America, I means Canada, USA, Europe, some countries in Asia have a protection and animal law. I mean, Cuba, we need the same. We need the same. We are. Make I means because the internet, because the internet, we are sharing this information. The people are joining to these houses. I mean, it's a beautiful house because we are fighting for animals, for animal, and yes, we are suffering persecution by the police and the government. Is too bad. We can see uh, videos, photos of uh, police, secret police, um, on the corner of the um, of your house means if you're an animal activist you will have uh, someone of the government um, watching you near you and uh, I mean it's complicated it's not all the way I mean it's complicated for all the the, the independent independent social movement in the country animal act, animalistic activists or journalists means in, independent journalists San Isidro as well, artistic uh, uh, movement. Every, means everything is complicated. It's a chaos in Cuba. But well, we are doing our best. We are doing our best. We are fighting for our right. We need to say it. We need to, we need to say it. We need to cheer. We need, we need to feel empathy for another movement. Means animal activists, we feel empathy with Asan Isidro, with the, art, the artistic independence, uh, independent independence uh, um, artist, with the uh, twenty seven uh, uh, M. We are sharing this empathy. I mean, it's beautiful because we are joining, and we are sharing this information by internet. Internet is 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 our welcome right now in Cuba. Well, the, Internet and also our voice too is our weapon. But don't have any. Gracias. Por, I'm, so, I'm sorry, guys. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I am going to give the floor to Erika uh, Guevara, uh, the representative of Amnesty International and uh, also the director for Latin America for the region. 
her office is in Mexico City, and so she has uh, she's connecting to us from Mexico City. I hope the connection is better than the connection with Cuba. We're having so many trouble in in listening to you and, and how you deserve to be listened. Uh, Erika, please, you have a floor. And thank you for your struggle in favor of the Cubans. Thank you, Juan Antonio, and thank you to the foundation for for the invitation to this panel. It's a privilege for me to be able to share this space with uh, Kisi, with Dennis, with uh, all the people of Cuba, and particularly the members of these very diverse social movements that have been emerging in Cuba over the last uh, few years in response to the repression of the government. And, and, and they are showing, demonstrating that social organizing uh, could continue in spite of this repression and in spite of all the consequences that individuals and the collectives are facing. So it is really an honor for me uh, to be able to share with you. We know how difficult it is for people in, in Cuba to connect over the internet because we know exactly that the internet has been used as a tool for social change, but has been also used as a tool uh, for repression given the government uh, monopoly and control over the, the internet and all over the social media in general. So um, I'm very pleased that we have been able to hear from Dennis and Kisi and that we are going to hear from others uh, being um, innovative in the use of video. So thank you very much, Juan Antonio. And, and uh, I mean, I, I want to talk briefly about uh, some of the concerns that Amnesty International has been expressing over the last uh, few years, over the last decades, but also the important role that the international community has in order to protect the rights of those who are now being uh, exposed to these levels of repression that we have heard from, from Kisi and Dennis and that we have heard from many of the members of different movements, particularly Movimiento San Isidro, but also from other movements that have emerged in response and in resistance to the level of repression that people in the, in the country are facing. And just to give you kind of a sense of history, right? And, and how Amnesty has been documenting human rights violations in Cuba for many years. When Amnesty International was established in 1961, the organization wrote a letter to the Cuban em embassy in London expressing concern about a prisoner of conscience. Since then, uh, our organization has identified thousands of cases of people unjustly detained in Cuba solely for the peaceful exercise of the rights to freedom of expression and peaceful assembly. In the 90s, the Cuban authorities started to shift away from mostly using long-term imprisonment to silence uh, um, political criticism, human rights criticism, and towards the use of frequent short-term arbitrary arrest and detention, a tactic that continues to this day. And Amnesty International can consistently denounce this tactic of repression because we know that has the intention to silence those who dare to speak up, but also to disencourage uh, these new and emerging social movements to continue demanding full respect for human rights, and also demanding political participation, particularly of youth and those who have been perceived as a, by a threat by the authorities, but are really and truly human rights defenders that are trying to organize to ensure the protection of human rights in the island. As you know very well, independent human rights organizations and mechanisms, including special reporters on, on, of the UN and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights have not had access to Cuba for decades. So it has been very difficult also to monitor the situation and document in situ the situation that many people are facing currently and that many people have faced historically. Uh, Cuba is the only country in the Americas, for instance, which Amnesty International doesn't have permission from the authorities to access. We have multiple times uh, request access to, to the country to Cuban authorities by sending letters. Uh, me personally, we, I've been meeting with representatives uh, in Geneva demanding access to the country so that we can monitor also in situ the conditions 
uh, particularly of those who have been detained and continue to be in prison, but also of the multiple reports that we receive from, from human rights defenders, from independent journalists, from activists, from artists, of the multiple forms of human rights violations that they are facing in the country. Um, we know that human rights defenders uh, have faced particular risk. I mean, we have heard from Dennis uh, some of his experience defending the rights of animals, but also we have heard from many other human rights defenders defending different types of rights, including social and economic rights, demanding the state authorities full respect for economic and social rights, particularly of those communities who have been marginalized historically in Cuba, including rural communities, uh, black communities um, that are totally marginalized from policies uh, that the Cuban government have put in place. Uh, some of these policies that are more propaganda about you know, the achievements of the revolution, when in reality, we know that people are suffering grave economic and social human rights mm -hmm. violations. But then human rights defenders and those who dare to speak up, to demand the protection of human rights or to denounce the situation in, in the country are facing multiple risks that go from short-term detention, arbitrary detention, uh, fines. Now we have seen this trend where uh, human rights defenders and journalists and activists are being fined because they are posting something in social media or because they are simply posting a live video denouncing some of the uh, violations that they are facing uh, from the police authorities and from other state authorities. Erika. Erika. Um, yes. Erika, you hear me? Yes, Juan Antonio, I hear you very well. I, I, apo I, I duly apologize for interrupting, but we have, uh, you know, we're going to have only two minutes before he goes back to a meeting in Congress of uh, Representative Albio Cides. If you will be so kind to, you know, turn the floor to him and then we'll go back to you again. Yes, of course, that, go ahead, yes. You're very kind. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Congressman Albio Cides, who's a Cuban American uh, from Northern New Jersey and as chairman of the House of Western Hemisphere Subcommittee, he has played always a major role in promoting human rights in Cuba. And he's a good friend of the Foundation for Human Rights. And he has been very kind in hopping out of his meetings to say a few words of solidarity with uh, Movimiento San Isidro and the other social movements in Cuba. And then he had to run back to his session. So we really appreciate a uh, representative of what you have done for us and you now have the floor. Well, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I'll hear you. Okay, great. I want to thank the Foundation of Human Rights of Cuba for hosting this event and for inviting me to speak today. I also want to recognize and thank my good friend and colleague, Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who has been a tireless advocate for democracy and human rights in Cuba. I am proud to support a resolution that Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz is leading that expresses solidarity with the San Isidro movement and condemns the repeated attacks by the Cuban regime against the movement's leaders. I am joining Senator Menendez, Senator Rubio, Congressman diaz Bollard for today's event. Last November, the San Isidro movement exposed the continued repression of the Castro and Diaz Canal regime. The movement taught the world many important lessons. It showed that there is a vibrant community of artists, activists, and young social leaders who are developing creative ways to test the limits of what is allowable in Cuba. The San Isidro movement also showed the world that Cuba is not a stagnant society that is frozen in time, as, in, as many observers seem to believe. This is a country that is in a state of flux where a brutal authoritarian regime is clinging desperately to power amid a rapidly changing world. As the San Isidro movement demonstrated, internet access is a powerful tool for citizens to reclaim their fundamental rights. At the same time, the Cuban state has responded as we will expect it to by restricting content 
cracking down on activists and expanding its surveillance apparatus with the help of China and Russia. But what gives me hope about the future in Cuba is that talented young people are developing innovative ways to get around the government's restrictions. These brave individuals are shaking the very foundation of the Cuban dictatorship and they deserve our support. I will close by saying that, as many of you know, I was born in Cuba and the subject of Cuba policy has always been deeply personal to me. During my 15 years in Congress, I have never wavered in advocating for democracy and human rights in Cuba. Last Congress, I held a hearing on the disastrous human rights situation in Cuba. As chairman of the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee, again, this Congress, I will continue to be very vocal in consistently calling for the promotion of human rights to be at the center of US policy towards Cuba. Thank you again for the invitation to speak and thank you to all who, are, who have joined us for this event. Thank you. Thank you, Representative, and thanks a lot for all the effort that you made to join us despite your heavy schedule today. And, uh, and thank you for your words, your kind words towards the foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry again, uh, uh, Erica, I, I really apologize. But you know, <laughs> I, I have been in many, moderating many panels in my life, but this is a tough one. We have to juggle with many, many people who want to, to talk and, and to express their solidarity, which I believe is great. I believe is great. So I'm doing my best here. Uh, please go ahead with your intervention. Thank you, Juan Antonio. Don't worry, you don't have to apologize. And uh, probably in other circumstances, I, I could have asked you to pay a trip to Cuba, but as I said, I'm not allowed to access the country. So uh, do not worry about my, my penalty for interruption. No, I, I do understand. And, and we know how difficult it is to hold uh, uh, an event on Cuba, precisely because of all the difficulties that our, our peer human rights defenders and activists face in Cuba, but also because we know that there is a level of solidarity that has been important over the last decades, but particularly now has been very important in relation to Movimiento San Isidro and in relation to other social movements that really require that level of solidarity because it has been a strong mechanism of protection. So um, it is important that I mention that. And I, I was talking about some of the the risks and, and some of the human rights violations that human rights defenders, independent journalists, activists, artists uh, are, are facing in this uh, state of repression, this policy of repression that has been imposed by the Cuban government for many years and that these tactics have increased over the last few years precisely because of uh, the internet, because of social media, because this independent uh, media outlets that have emerged in Cuba and, and the threat that they represent uh, uh, for the government. So the increasing kind of uh, repression and persecution against of these people have increased as well and, and the risk that they are facing individually and in that collective. But I think it is also important to mention that repression is not only targeting those who dare to speak out. Ordinary Cubans feel also suffocated by a, by a web of a state control over the daily lives. Part of that control is, for instance, if you want to hold a job, you have to ag agree with everything the government says or everything the government instructs you to do. And we've seen how also this uh, wealth web of control over ordinary Cubans is having a, an impact on the exercise of human rights and particularly on the protection of those who dare to speak out. I mean, we've seen these scene, uh, scenes images that are being sent through social media, live uh, video recording of these kind of attacks, social attacks, right? Against human rights defenders, independent journalists and activists by ordinary people. But behind that, we also know that there is a wave of state control that is imposing rules 
to those people who want to hold a job or who want to have certain privilege access to food or whatever. And this is used against people also to demonstrate against human rights defenders and independent journalists. So I think that it is important to mention that repression and persecution is not only targeting those who dare to speak, but it's also targeting ordinary Cubans. And for that, it is important that the international community plays an important role in demanding Cuban authorities to put an end to these repressive policies that have been the characteristic of, of the government over the last decades. And just, and just to say that what we are seeing with Movimiento San Isidro and with these emerging movements of very diverse type of people, we have independent journalists, we have human rights defenders, artists that comprise these movements, but we are also seeing other type of, of, of Cubans that are demanding and defending different types of rights. We've seen women uh, as, as leaders of some of these movements really representing a different voice and different type of denial. Uh, uh, denouncement that it is important because there is not only the repression, it, there is not only the violations of civic and political rights, what is happening in Cuba. I mean, we have heard that there are other rights that have been violated and are also very invisible in this network of impunity that the government has created for itself, right? None of these human rights violations have been investigated properly. And because there is no international scrutiny that is allowed to enter the, the country, it is very difficult that people who have suffered human rights violations, all these artists, all these independent journalists, all these human rights defenders can access to any level of justice uh, for all the abuses and violations that the police authorities or all the authorities have committed against them. And in that sense, I'm, 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 I'm just going to be very brief in some of the calls and recommendations that we uh, that we are presenting to the international community in general, but particular to certain governments that have an influence on Cuba. And, and one of the first recommendations, I think it is important that I reiterate that this has been the position of Amnesty International for many years, is the call that we are uh, um, doing to the US government. Uh, and we are now more than ever putting a lot of pressure on the new administration to really take all the necessary steps toward lifting the economic, financial, and trade embargo against Cuba, which undermines economic, social, and cultural rights for people in the country, but also has served as an excuse for the government of Cuba to continue imposing a repressive state apparatus that is affecting the exercise of human rights of all people in the island. And now that Cuba is a member of the Human Rights Council, uh, we are also calling on state members uh, to fulfill their obligations to condemn human rights violations and demand access to human rights mechanisms to the country, including the special report here of, on freedom of expression and peaceful assembly, uh, that it is important that can monitor and document the situation in the island. And in the interest of transparency and to facilitate independent and objective monitoring and reporting on a range of human rights issues in Cuba, independent human rights organizations such as Amnesty International should be able to enter the country. So we are urging that dialogue between Cuba and the international community via bilateral or multilateral relationships have to include a demand on the access of independent organizations to the country so that we can continue monitoring, but also that we can create mechanisms to protect those organizations and human rights defenders uh, in the country that are continuing their struggle for, for human rights and social justice. So I would end here and open for questions later about other important issues. Thank you, Juan Antonio. Thank you so much, Erica. Uh, I will now use the opportunity to also allow you to uh, listen to two important messages that were sent to us by two senators, Senator Rubio and Senator Rick Scott. Senator Rubio uh, comes from our Cuban American community also here in Miami-Dade County and as chairman and, and ranking member of the Senate Western Hemisphere Subcommittee, he has made bringing democracy and freedom to Cuba one of his top priorities. So I would like uh, the, co the technical coordinator of this event to uh, connect us with the message. Thank you. Hello, this is Senator Marco Rubio, and I wanted to thank the Foundation for Human Rights in Cuba for inviting me to join you virtually 
As you highlight the ongoing repression by the Castro Diaz Canal regime against pro democracy movements inside of Cuba, this attempt to crush the voices of Cuba's civil society, independent journalists, political prisoners, and other individuals, it remains one of the regime's top strategies to punish those who publicly defy them. For years, groups such as the Ladies in White and Umbaku have been the targets of the regime's campaign of, of terror. The dictatorship's newest target, however, is the members of the San Isidro movement. Last year, the world watched as Cuban artists, academics, and other dissidents took to the streets of Havana to condemn the regime's crackdown against artistic expression and the growing number of arbitrary arrests. And these courageous individuals are part of the generation of Cubans who are raising their voices against tyranny. The uprising of the San Isidro movement comes at a time when the regime has realized that their authority is unsustainable in the long run. Not only because the party's old hardliners are dying out, but also because the Cuban people are uniting from multiple sectors of society to condemn decades of repression. I want to applaud the courage of all of the San Isidro movement members, especially the founding members joining this panel today. It's very simple to speak out against tyrants outside of their domain but every single one of you living on the island is doing so at a tremendous personal risk. I want you to know that you are not alone in this fight. Just two weeks ago, I was proud to join a bipartisan group of U.S. Senators in expressing our solidarity with the San Isidro movement. Many of us stand with you and are committed to seeing a Cuba where freedom of speech is upheld and defended. As a Cuban American, my wish for the people of Cuba is that they may one day freely elect their leaders and live free of Castro's authoritarian grip. Que Dios los bendiga a todos. Okay, uh, I would like the technical coordinator to also uh, pass the Rick Scott one minute message that he sent us, which was very kind of him. Uh, Rick Scott has been a major leader in opposing the dictatorship in both Cuba and Venezuela. And he has played also a key role in exposing the human trafficking operation of Cuba, money-making operation of Cuba, exploiting the Cuban doctors uh, that go abroad. So do we have that video ready? Uh, thank you. Hi, I'm Senator Rick Scott. Today, I want to recognize the brave men and women who continue to fight every day for freedom and democracy in Cuba. For far too long, the Castro regime has oppressed and persecuted those who seek to make their voices heard. But we cannot stop fighting. As a U.S. Senator, I will continue to do everything in my power to bring a new day of freedom in Cuba, Venezuela, and Latin America. To every brave man and woman of the San Isidro movement, no te rindas, juntos seguiremos luchando por la libertad y democracia por la gente de Cuba. Gracias. Thank you. As I said before, we lost the connection with Alfredo Martinez. Uh, normally, in any, in any other normal circumstances, we, we would have thought that there is a storm or something, but we are used to this kind of incidents in the case of programs that have to do with the situation in Cuba. But we do have a video of Alfredo that we asked him to, to prepare just in case that something like this would happen. So I would like uh, the technical coordinator also to get that video for us. Hi, hello. Uh, first of all, I, will, I would like to thank you for the invitation to this conference. My name is Alfredo Martinez Ramirez. I'm 29 years old. I'm civil engineer. I live in the Havana and I work as a journalist in the independent magazine called Tremenda Nota. Tremenda Nota is a magazine dedicated mainly to the LGTB community and women in Cuba. Also, I'm a member of the 27N. Uh, it is a group of independent artists, intellectual filmmakers, activists, and journalists who demand respect for freedom of expression. And also, uh, we demand the end of censorship and harassment of artists and people with different political thoughts in Cuba. The name arose as a result of the massive concentration that took place outside the culture ministry of Cuba on November 27. 
uh, in response to the repressive escalation against artists in Cuba, to demand the right to freedom of expression and creativity, as well the freedom of the rapper Denis Solis. I firmly believe that the art must question the power. In recent years, some creative collective on the island, such as Omni, Zona Franca, San Isidro Movement, uh, have exerted pressure on the boundaries of the art institution. Uh, this pressure has produced a redefinition of the legal boundaries of cultural politics which accentuates the artificial demarcation between the political and the artistic. My first step making artivists was um, work uh, with the group of independent artists and writers, uh, Anima Group. This group uh, it's created to rescue um, the historical memory of Cuba through the art. Later, I got involved in a project, uh, Horizontal Park. Um, that project provides an, a space of autonomous thought in Cuba and makes visible independent projects that are created to improve the current Cuban civil society. Like these groups and projects, there is also an institution led by the well-known Cuban artist Tania Bruguera. In start, uh, it's an institute that carry out actions and relate the theoretical events with the objective to investigate the obstacle to the cultural freedom on the island. Um, these movement projects and institutes fulfill functions that the Cuban government has put aside and do not constitute a, a pro priority in the country. The other thing is that it makes it very clear that you cannot have artistic, artistic freedoms without half. Uh, political freedoms. Here I'm gonna I'm gonna to stop for a minute and I'm going to develop this idea because um, I say this because we have too many examples. I'm going to focus on the events of the end of the last year and the beginning of this one. Um, the year 2020 can be described as a complex year in the Cuban cultural context. Do, uh, do the repression of artists, the imposition of censorship mechanisms from the law and violation of the right to free, free expression in general. Um, as an example, I'm going to talk about the events of the hunger strike in San Isidro, which occurred uh, about at the end of November last year. They stay at the headquarters of San, San, Fran, San Isidro move, movement. Many activists, artists, and journalists went to the police station Cuba y Chacón to inquire about the status of the musician Denis Solis, unjustly prosecuted on the charge of contempt. Uh, I was detained for more than 20 hours without any legal reason of, at the Cojima police station. Then during the strike, they, they were chemically attacked with an acid. The state security agents prevent access to other people who went to, head, to the headquarters and they began a campaign to discredit the artists, journalists and activists who were there in the official media and in short, a serial violations of human rights. On November 27, as, to, as a result of these violations and abuse, we decide to meet in, in protests spontaneously outside the culture ministry. They were around 300 or more people 
and 30 were selected to speak with Vice Minister Fernando Rojas. Among those 30, I was I. In that meeting, in a way to summarize, because it was more deep, uh, three central issues were debated. The first one is how the Interior Ministry filters his power in cultural institutions and how Culture Ministry uh, maintains a policy of apparent ignorance about, the, about this problematic. The second one is how the Cuban institution categorized with unfavorable aesthetic criteria about artists who disagree uh, the country's politics. And the third one is about the bad experience, censorship, persecution, arbitrary arrest to the independent artists from part of the political Cuban police. Uh, the 27N it is a group that advocates dialogue, but the dialogue has to be on equal terms. We don't believe in violence, and violence is what we have received. This January 27, we met again outside of the culture ministry. This time around 30 people in a peaceful manner demanding that dialogue with conditions and the way in which we were violated and treated is unconstitutional uh, because they break uh, laws that are included in the current Cuban constitution and the government and the political police do not respect. I ended up with a fractured finger because they pounced on me to try to take my cell phone away and for weeks they have maintained a discrediting and hateful speech in the official media about the people who integrate this group. For finish, I would like to tell to American government if they plan to start negotiations with the Cuban government again, we need a broad representation of Cuban society in all its social and political diversity diversity. Uh, as a difference from the previous process, the, nego the negotiation has to be under condition of transparency with equal access to the official and independent media, as well as the international press. And also all negotiations must have a, a, purpose, a purpose to the recognition of the civil, economic and political rights of the Cuban people. Thank you a lot. Well, I will call later Alfredo whenever we can restore the communications to thank him for his detailed and thoughtful presentation. I, if, if you allow me, I have a last message to pass and then I would like to have a second round of reactions from the three survival panelists uh, that have not been knocked out by the Cuban government uh, on before we, enter uh, you know, a stage of questions and answers. Some people, many people are watching this right now and some people would like, uh, have been actually, I understand sending some questions and so on. So if you allow me, I would like to introduce, uh, he doesn't probably need any introduction, but Congressman Mario Diaz Balar from Miami, who's also a member of the House Appropriation Committee and who has been uh, a fearless champion of programs supporting human rights in Cuba. Do we have that video set up? Thank you. Thank you to Tony Costa and the many other friends for putting this very important event together. I especially thank the brave pro-democracy activists of the San Isidro movement and all, all of the courageous activists within Cuba who have risked and risked everything for freedom freedom of the Cuban people, some of whom are here participating in this event. Today, we also commemorate 25 years since the Brothers of the Rescue shootdown, when the Castro regime murdered four innocent humanitarians in international airspace. That horrific act of barbarism demonstrated once again 
the savage nature of the Castro regime, which has no respect for the sanctity of human life, and certainly not the rights and freedoms that are inherent in every human being. That act also revealed the serious threat posed by the regime in Cuba, both within to the Cuban people and even outside of the island. It is this regime, that horrific regime, that the heroes of the San Isidro movement confront in Cuba each and every day. Harassment, loss of professional licenses, violent acts of repudiation, and imprisonment are all consequences that these brave activists are facing. Yet despite these pressures, despite this savagery, the movement is growing. Artists and musicians and writers are demanding freedom from censorship, which as they know so well, stifles creativity and expression. The United States, the United States must continue to stand with all of those in Cuba who are willing to demand basic freedoms and democratic change in the island. Today's event is important to raise awareness of those on the island who are demanding change and to forcefully, forcefully condemn, condemn the human rights abuses perpetuated against them, against these brave Cubans. We are enriched by hearing from their voices and experiences, and the Cuban people must also be able to hear them. When the Cuban people are finally free, and they will be free, it will be due to the courage and the determination of people such as these who risk their livelihoods, their freedom, and their lives for the right to speak without fear. Thank you. Thank you for shedding light on the human rights abuses on the island and the bravery of those who refuse to be silenced. Thank you to the brave activists on the island who are leading the way to freedom despite grave personal risks. Cuba va a ser libre por la determinación y el heroísmo de los cubanos como los del movimiento San Isidro. Y nosotros tenemos el deber de hacer todo lo posible para apoyarlos, para que el mundo conozca y se una a esos dignos y valientes cubanos. Muchas gracias. We thank uh, Representative Diaz Balar for his kind words and his support, his permanent support for the, the struggle of the Cuban people. If you allow me now, I would like to ask a question to all of you, the three of survivals, as I call you, of our conversation. And, uh, you know, I would like you to give me, if possible, a, a brief response so that we can save some time for the segment of questions and answers. One thing that we have always been concerned outside of Cuba is to what extent is the Cuban government ready to go under current circumstances in order not to lose their power. And one of the things that we know that they use to instill fear in the population is that they are ready to go to any extent. They are ready to squash any any resistance, they are ready to, uh, you know, spill the blood in the streets if necessary in order to keep order, their order and their power intact. Uh, I wonder in the current circumstances of the 21st century, which are not the circumstances of 1989 in Tiananmen Square in China, where there was no internet, there were no smartphones, uh, there were no instant connection with the world, no satellites, broadcasting images, if that is possible, or in a certain way, even though you may have as many tanks as you may like, and you may have as many airplanes as you may like, and as many toys of repression as you may like, there is an invisible red line that the government knows they cannot cross because that might bring about a strong final determined reaction by the international community and by the Cuban people because at the end this is an internal conflict between the Cuban people and that totalitarian state. The rest is the peripheral uh, circumstances in which the Soviet Union got involved, Venezuela got involved and other you know freedom uh, democracies in the world had got involved. But the core of this conflict 
is between a state that denies the rights of the Cuban people and the Cuban people that want their rights back, right? Now, to what extent can they cross that invisible line and use all the little power that they have in those toys, in those tanks, in that artillery, in order to keep their power when that is not really, when it's not really possible in the 21st century to keep that massacre invisible to the world. When you have tens of thousands of cell phones and smartphones that even if they turn down the internet, they can record videos that are going to sneak out and the world will be watching what is happening in Cuba. So I would like you know, you to give me your reactions. Do you think that these, these two things, the possibility of having the whole world watching, which is one of the, of the key, let's say, duties of our foundation, and of course, of, of Amnesty International, for example, would have an effect in deterring the Cuban government from resorting to all the arsenal that they have of repression and that we can eventually with our solidarity, with paying attention to what's going on with our continuous alerts, with events like this one, to keep the world watching and not get distracted so that we can keep the government you know, in line and they will always repress, we know that, but that they will not cross that barbaristic line that they have crossed in the past and that other systems similar to that one have crossed in the past. I would like you know, to know your, your ideas briefly. <laughs> I took more time than, than I'm giving you now uh, to explain whatever you think about this. Maybe this time I, I start with you, Dennis. Well, um, everyone knows that uh, the state uh, people relationship is broken. And there are more love than ops. Uh, there, is, there is social unrest. People are looking for places to feel hopeful. And I mean, I mean independent um, so, uh, social movement in the country. Uh, the, uh, the people are looking for solution. I'm looking for solution to everyone here inside of the country. Um, we are looking for answer. And I believe that the violence is not the way, is not the way, I mean, it's not only here in Cuba, in everywhere, it's in everywhere. The violence is not the way to change nothing. Even since coming from the, the government, and you know, we are suffering a lot of violence from the police, um, is it's very sad, it's very sad. See a big line of people waiting for a bite, chicken or bread or something more. They have to wait 10 or 20, not 20 hours, but it's 10 hours, some time to buy something. It's sad. And also, I mean, uh, all these movements here in the island have, uh, uh, I mean, all the movement here have a real impact. I mean, in political, uh, political, cultural, uh, symbolic, spiritual uh, here. And um, let me see, uh, let me say more. Um, bo uh, live in Cuba, born and live in Cuba, uh, motivates you every day uh, to believe different cultures and giving them importance to fight for your rights. I mean, I am an um, uh, animalistic activist, but I also, I am environmentalist activists in my country. And also I'm trying to reach in to people in need. In need. I sometimes I give them to family in need or food or money, something like that, because they need it. Because they need the support. And I mean we need to support ourselves. We need to support ourselves. We need it. And to do that, we need to we need to um, um, to get more people here. And the internet is, uh, is, a, is a very good weapon. You said it in China in 1991, no internet, no connection it was difficult when the, we saw this video, the tanks in the, the plaza, in the big plaza in Beijing, um, China. 
against the people. We saw this, all this, this video in YouTube and oh my God, it's horrible, it's terrible. See all those tanks over the people. We don't want the same here in Cuba. I mean, this fight, this internal fight belong to the people. Belong to the people, belong to the artists, belong to, to the, um, to the uh, independent journalists, belong to the people in general, in general. And this is my, uh, means my opinion, my idea about the situation here with all the activists in, in the country, with all the movement in the country. We want human rights, we want gay rights, we want um, women rights, we want animal rights, we need it. We are waiting for that. We need to say it. We need to leave it. We need to be free. And I mean, that's my idea. But I mean, the, all the movement in the country uh, are having a real socioeconomic, cultu uh, cultural, symbolic, and a spiritual impact. It's a relief. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Casey? Yes, uh, Juan Antonio, I truly believe we are witnessing a massive awakening of the Cuban citizens. And this also means that not just the civic society, but also the militaries and those that, uh, that support the repression inside the island, they are getting another point of view of the situation in Cuba. And um, I don't know, this is an unofficial notice, uh, an unofficial news, but today in the morning, I, I will say that uh, militaries in Cuba are uh, signing a letter where they say they are not, um, they are not, they not agree to apply any violence against the Cuban population. And this means we are uh, through public um, demonstrations, we are uh, raising another conscience inside the island. Um, we are receiving a great support from democratic governments around the world. And this is an, a, a point of turn in the political in Cuba. I think we are not gonna see a massive repression this time because the dictatorship have not that much power right now. They depend on the economic support from other countries because they don't have any economic um, you know, they don't have any economic foundation they need. They need uh, money from inside the island because their economic um, reality is like zero. They, they, need, they need us here on the exile. They need another country like Venezuela to get some money and some weapons and all that things, but well, the, the point is, I don't think they are in the point to make a massive um, military um, fight against the population in Cuba. I'm sorry, I was muted. Erika, I'm sorry. Uh, well, Juan Antonio, this is a very important question, right? I mean, on, on the 60 years of experience that Amnesty has had in, in, in Cuba and documenting human rights violations and, and documenting these policies of repression and how the government has been adapting, right? These policies of repression to, to the current context, including now with the internet, with the control of social media. Uh, I mean, we have to acknowledge that there are apparatus, the propaganda apparatus, the repressive state, uh, control state uh, policies 
are, are also innovating, right, in some way. I mean, they continue to um, create the simulation that they are creating political participation for people. I mean, we saw that during the constitutional reform and all the promises that it was going to be an open and uh, an active process where people were truly going to participate in designing, right, the future of the country. And at the end of the day, we, we saw with the constitutional reform and we continue to see with all uh, the, the government attempts to to demonstrate that they are willing to that to open dialogue, that they are willing to respect the, the rights to freedom of expression and peaceful assembly, but that nothing is changing really in, in, in on the side of the government. But on the other hand, and I think that it is important to mention because we've seen over these 60 years, many emerging social movements, the women in white and many other youth led movements uh, that have emerged in different decades in Cuba with a huge difference, right? They didn't have access to internet. They didn't have access to social media. They didn't have any possibility to create independent media outlets that the ones that we are seeing now being led by people, journalists in the country. This is something that we haven't seen before. And I think that it is important to acknowledge. And of course, I don't wanna put all the pressure on, on human rights defenders and activists such as Denny and Kisi, but at the end of the day, what we are seeing is a major change in Cuban society. Now there is more access to information and, in, and despite this propaganda and the, and the monopoly of the media controlled by the state and the persecution and the criminalization that they are um, uh, you know, expanding on everyone that is participating in a social media to, through all these uh, uh, media outlets that they control, the reality is that ordinary Cubans are accessing information. Ordinary Cubans now know about Movimiento San Isidro. Ordinary Cubans know about the incredible courage that activists, journalists, artists, and ordinary people have in that November 27, when they were protesting in front of the Minister of Culture, the Ministry of Culture. This is something that was happening before, but the world and the ordinary Cubans didn't have access, right? So I do think that it is important to mention that the context has changed, that social mobilization is happening in Cuba, that youth in particular are leading a new friend waves of movements that are truly demanding the protection of human rights and are, are calling on the government for accountability. And this represents a major threat, of course, for those who are daring to speak out. And we are seeing the levels of surveillance and harassment uh, are totally unacceptable under international law and any kind of uh, government should be, you know, protesting and, and condemning these acts against acts activists, independent journalists, human rights defenders, and many other people who are now speaking up. Artists that are truly demonstrating that art can be a tool of social change. Uh, journalists, independent journalists that are using their cell phones to report on the situation in Cuba. I mean, many others that are truly using these tools that have been used in the past to control them, they are using it in innovative ways to, to change uh, Cuban society as well, and to kind of awaken uh, political activism and social activism within Cuban society. So yes, uh, the past few years have been bittersweet, uh, a bittersweet period for those who, um, who have been hoping for major change to happen. And, but there are plenty of opportunities now for the Cuban government to shift its policies, to shift its repressive apparatus and to create true dialogue with the people that now are demanding from their authorities accountability and respect for human rights. Thank you so much, Erica. Uh, I want to say something that normally would have been said at the beginning but I prefer to leave it for the, for the end of the, of the session. And is why we chose this date, 24th of February, to organize this meeting. Uh, every Cuban knows. <laughs> All Cubans knows that on the 24th of February of 1895, the last war for independence was fought, was started by Jose Marti in person, who died a little later in, in, in the field, in the battlefield in Cuba. And, but there are a number of incidents like the one that uh, Representative Diaz-Balart uh, 
reminded us in terms of the shooting of the Brothers of the Rescue also happened around this day. For example, on the 23rd of February uh, was also the day that uh, Orlando Zapata Tamayo died in prison in his hunger strike, demanding prison uh, his, his own rights as a prisoner that were denied to him. And then he was denied even the water and he died in prison in that hunger strike one day before the, the anniversary of, of the beginning of this war of independence. And as Diaz Balar uh, reminded us, these people were shut down, that was a crime. But I want to add something to that comment. That was not only a crime against those four people who died in that incident. To me, who, who I had a, an, an access to a certain information at that time, that was a genocide of Fidel Castro, a deliberate genocide by Fidel Castro, who was offered an olive branch by several countries in the West, including President Clinton, and decided to sabotage any dialogue with anybody in order to keep his reign of terror intact. So he couldn't, he, not only he wouldn't mind, he deliberately planned in advance with a mole that was inside the group of, of the pilots, the shooting down of those airplanes to make sure that there will be an incident that will break down any conversation, any negotiation. And believe me, I was at that time in Cuba and people were starving. People were going really hungry. So it was not only a crime against four people, which was absolutely unjustifiable. It was also a genocide, a crime against humanity, because the situation of Cuba could have taken a better path at that time if he, instead of entrenching himself in his you know, system of, of oppression and so on, would have opened up to the world and would have started to have dialogues uh, with different countries, France, Canada, the United States and others that were Spain that were offering an olive branch so that a transition, a peaceful transition, as Dennis was asking for before, could take place. Uh, it's good to keep this in mind because unfortunately, some of the people who run Cuba today believe in continuidad, continuity of that Cold War mentality in which you should not dialogue with anybody because that is a sign of weakness and you should not try to reach a common ground because that's a sign of weakness. And, you know, we hope that with the peaceful, nonviolent struggle that heroes like you in Cuba are carrying out nowadays, we will land in a better place. But I can assure you, and I'm sure that Erika will agree in this with me, that the world is watching and we are not going to allow a massacre against the Cuban people go wildly. We are not going to allow that there will be no consequences if they use lethal power against peaceful demonstrations. So I wanted to remind everybody that this is a historical date. And in this date, everybody's reaffirming its commitment to the freedom of Cuba and to human rights in Cuba. Uh, having said this, uh, I think that we lose the, the contact with other people. I just have to thank you. We are also out of time. <laughs> it's, 10, it's already 11.30. Uh, I am very, very grateful to all of you and to all the people that jumped in, at least for a couple of minutes to say hello and to express their solidarity with the struggle of the Cuban people. And we'll carry on. We'll carry on until we seek a free cure for all, like Jose Marti dream it. Thank you, every thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for hosting this panel. Thank you.